The Gospel of Luke contains the most familiar account of the birth of Jesus. That's the account with the shepherds out in the field and the angels coming to announce the birth of Jesus to the shepherds. And then, of course, the shepherds go into Bethlehem and they see Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. And it says that they then leave and go out and tell a bunch of people about it. Now, that all happens in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 1 contains things leading up to the birth of Jesus. And Luke chapter 1 opens with the account of an elderly man and woman, Zacharias and Elizabeth. They are elderly. They have had no children. And God works, though, so Elizabeth can get pregnant, and the child she will bear will become John the Baptist. Now, after that, the scene switches to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and we learn that she is a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary and tells her that although she is a virgin, through the power of God, she will bear a son, and this will be Jesus. The angel also tells her about how Elizabeth will also bear a son. And then we are told that Mary and Elizabeth are cousins. And so after a while, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And when she gets there, she finds that Elizabeth is pregnant. And when Mary comes in, the baby in Elizabeth's womb jumps for joy when it hears Mary's voice. And Elizabeth says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then Mary says something that we heard in our reading from Luke. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maid servant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Now that is technically what is called the Magnificat in Christianity. Some people call it the Song of Mary. And I thought it would be interesting to look at that. The name Magnificat comes from the first word of what Mary says in Latin. And if you remember, the original copies of the manuscripts of the New Testament are in Greek. And in the late 300s, early 400s, those began to be translated into Latin because that was the language of Rome at the time, where the Roman Catholic Church was. And so the first real Bible translations are translations from Greek into Latin. And Magnificat is the first word of what Mary said. And Magnificat, if you see that written down, looks for like magnify, and that's actually what it means. Magnificat means to make something big, to make something great. And so Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And so in this religious sense, the word magnificat would mean to exalt and to pray. Mary is exalting God. She is praising God. Now, this first sentence is a compound structure. In the first part, Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord. In the second part, she says, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Now, there is a difference of opinion among biblical scholars in this little sentence here. Some say that soul and spirit both refer to the same thing. 
Others say that soul and spirit are two different things. According to this view, the soul is that which is responsible for our physical life. The soul is the energy that animates our body and makes our body alive. And according to this view, the spirit is something separate. It is us. Our spirit is what dwells within our body and what is us. Our spirit makes us more than just a body with a beating heart and breathing and functioning kidneys and whatever. That's what our soul does is make all that function. But our spirit makes us me. It makes me me and you you. And so the soul is responsible for the body, the life of the body, the spirit is responsible for each of us being an individual. In other words, it is responsible for our spiritual, non-material being. Now, I don't know how to solve that disagreement right there among biblical scholars. My own opinion is that they do mean sort of separate things. But I think that doesn't really matter in this passage. I think the best way for us to think about it is that Mary is saying that with my whole being, my innermost being, deep in my heart, with everything I have, I am rejoicing and praising and giving thanks to God. I think that's what she's saying. And notice that she uses the term God, my Savior. That literally is rescuer. And the meaning of save in the Bible is always rescue. The meaning of savior in the Bible is always rescuer. And so in the literal sense, Jesus rescues us. Now I think if we had always said that Jesus rescues us, we might have a completely different image of Jesus in, my mind, in our mind. If we saw Jesus as the rescuer, it might make us look at Jesus in a more, in a different way. Mary goes on to say, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maid servant. And that term lowly state is actually <laughs> one word. And people sometimes think of that Mary saying that I am humble. But that's not really the meaning of that word. That word was used as a derogatory term to denote the people on the very bottom of the economic ladder. People of very little means. They have no money. They have no social status. And in the Greek literature of the biblical period, a word like that was used as an insult. It denoted a poor person. Someone that was of little importance in society. And back then it was considered a shame to be called by that word. But here Mary says that that's exactly what she is. And then she goes on, the translators have translated it maidservant. Some of them translate it handmaiden. Literally, the word is slave. And so she refers to herself as God's slave. And that terminology is often used in the New Testament to describe our relationship with God. Now, whenever we see that, though, we have to be careful that we do not put our 21st century preconceptions about slavery onto that. This is coming from a completely different era when the concept of slavery was looked at much differently than we look at it today. Our image of slavery comes from the plantation of slavery in the Civil War period. Now, obviously, these people lived 2,000 years before that. So when we see the word slave used in the Bible, it does literally mean slave. But we can't put our own preconceived notions on that based on the 1800s in the United States. 
Then Mary says, For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. And that right there is the scriptural, one of the scriptural references that have been used to point to the devotion to Mary and those Christians that are devoted to Mary. That is one of the scriptural bases that they use. All generations will call me blessed. And so she's saying that even though I'm on the bottom rung, I'm down here at the bottom and I am insignificant to society, all generations will call me blessed. And the literal meaning of that word translated as blessing is happy. So all generations will call me happy. So Mary, although she is insignificant in society, she would be seen as a disgrace in society, but from now on, she will be called happy. And then Mary says, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. Now in these sentences we see God as mighty and strong. It is a term, those terms are used often in the Bible to refer to God. And they refer to God exercising power. God is strong. God is mighty. And God is so strong and mighty that we should fear Him. And that does literally mean fear. That's something that a lot of times we don't think of, but it does literally mean and then Mary says, He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. In the Bible, the proud refers to people who have a higher opinion of themselves than what is the reality. The literal image that that Greek word proud signifies is someone who thinks their shoulders stand above the shoulders of everyone else. In other words, if you're in a group of 20 people, this person thinks their shoulders are higher than the shoulders of everyone else. That's the meaning of proud in the Bible. People think they stand above other people. Then Mary says this, He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. Here, that word lowly is the word we talked about a minute ago. It's those on the bottom rung of society. Those who are on the bottom rung so far down that they are a disgrace. And this sentence contains a contrast. These on the bottom rung who are a disgrace. And then those on the top of the ladder, the mighty. Those who in the eyes of the world are at the very top. And it says that he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. Now there is a big disagreement within Christianity about how this particular passage should be interpreted. Some say that this represents an equaling. The ones on the bottom will be raised up to here and the ones at the top will be lowered down to here, so everyone will be equal. That used to be the way most Christians interpreted that. Everyone will be equal. Today, however, it's popular to say that this passage is talking about a reversal. Those on top will be knocked down to the bottom, and those on the bottom will be placed up at the top. Those at the bottom who used to be the victims, so to speak, of these at the top lording it over them will be raised to the top and now they'll get their chance to lord it over the people who used to lord it over them. Now you see this interpretation reflected in society today. 
It is reflected in American society today. We see those people who in years ago felt that they were at the bottom and now they want to be at the top and they want to lord it over those who they feel were previously on top and lorded it over them. And that is an unspoken idea, not necessarily unspoken, it is an idea, operative in our society today. Groups who basically say, now it's our turn to be on top and we're going to stomp on you now. And of course that's what they do. Now, my opinion, though, is that the proper interpretation of what Mary is saying is it's a great equal, a level, where those on the bottom are brought up and those on the top are brought down to where all are equal. And I believe this is the only way to interpret it and be consistent with the broad sweep of the Bible. I do not believe that it means that some will lord over others. Then Mary says, He has filled the hungry with good things, but the rich He has sent away empty. Now here we have another disagreement in interpretation. Some people interpret the words hungry and rich as allegory. And they say it refers to hungry and rich in a spiritual sense. Those who are rich in a spiritual sense believe they are full, believe they already understand everything, they already know everything about God. Those who are spiritually poor and hungry are those who know they don't know everything about God and are open to learn. And so one interpretation says that those who feel they already know everything about God, God would just dismiss them. And those who are open to learning and experiencing God anew, God will work within them. Others, however, interpret the words hungry and rich in a literal sense, meaning the terms rich and poor in a material sense. Now, given that this is the Gospel of Luke, and if you read the Gospel of Luke, you will see all through the Gospel, Luke talks almost constantly about the poor and denounces the rich. And all through the Gospel, from the context of that, you know that he is not using those terms allegorically. He is using the terms literally. The literal rich, materially speaking. And so it seems reasonable to say that Luke did not mean the hungry and rich in an allegorical sense right here at the beginning and it would mean it literally all the rest of the way through the gospel that would be inconsistent and so the terms I believe are obviously meant to be interpreted literally but that interpretation is really common in researching this sermon, I found out that the Magnificat of the Song of Mary is the single part of the Bible that has been set to music the most. These words that Mary stated have been set to music more than any other words of the Bible. That has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Composers have set these words in Mary to music, and it's even going on today. Even many modern composers today set the words of Mary to music. But in the United States today, in contemporary Christianity, there is a trend when setting the Magnificat to music, and that trend is that they leave out the sinner. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. They just simply leave them, just like it was in fact. Now, when you consider that contemporary Christian music appeals mostly to people in their twenties and thirties, <coughs> and it mostly appeals to the up and coming people in their twenties and thirties, people who are striving for the good life. They want the good life. 
and they're striving to be materially successful. How can you expect people like that who want the good life, who have devoted their lives to achieving the good life, how can you expect people like that to be singing a song that talks about God filling the hunger and sending the rich away empty? That would be very disturbing when you have devoted your life to be an up and coming, successful consumer. But it's also disturbing for everybody else, including for us and for people like us. Now, I guess we could comfort ourselves and say that when the Bible's talking about the rich, it's talking about Elon Musk and Bill Gates, people who are multi, multi, multi billionaires. They're talking about the super rich, the people that are worth tens of billions of dollars. I guess we could console ourselves with that and say that's what the Bible's talking about. Unfortunately, the Bible does not define what it means by rich. It does not indicate if it's only talking about the top 0.5% of society, the super rich, or maybe it's talking about the rich in the sense of the rich in comparison to the poor. People have different opinions about it. But the fact is that we just don't is it talking about the multi-billionaires of the world? Or is it talking about people that are worth a hundred million or more? Maybe she's talking about people that are worth ten million or more. Or maybe she's talking about people that are worth a million or more. Maybe it's talking about people who have an income only of ten thousand a month or more. Or maybe if your income's five thousand a month or more, you fall in that category. Maybe if your income is $1,500 a month, you fall in that category. We don't know, but we sure like to. Because I guarantee you when I define it, I'm going to define it at some point well above our monthly income and our net worth. Because I don't want to be put in the category of the rich. But you know, I have a sneaking suspicion when all is said and done. That's the category I will be placed in. Some people have different opinions about this. That's why passages like this are so difficult. I really don't know how to interpret this. It's something that bothers me. It is something that gives me reason to pause and think. So let's back up and see what we can see. Jesus will be born to a young woman who is at the bottom of society, socially and economically. Think about that for a minute. The one time in all of history when God becomes a human being, he chose to do it through a woman on the bottom rung of the ladder. Wouldn't it have made more sense than to do it to a woman who was a orthopedic surgeon and married to a guy who was a multi-millionaire real estate developer. Wouldn't it have made more sense to do that? But that's not what happened. God was not born of a woman of high social and economic standing. God chose to be born of a woman on one of the lowest rungs of the ladder. And you know, wouldn't we consider that be an insult? I mean, <clears throat> why wouldn't God have chosen to become a person, one of us, instead of one of them? We saw those who are proud having their pride, pride shattered. We saw the mighty brought down. And we saw those on the lowest rung raised up to where all are equal. We saw the hungry being filled. We saw the rich set away empty. The proud are shattered. The mighty brought down. The rich set away empty. Think about 
like this in relation to our society today. Who are the rich, the mighty, the powerful, the proud today? Who are they? Think about in the context of the local community in Cleveland County and Shelby. Who are the mighty, the rich, the powerful, the proud? When God came to become a human being, keep in mind that he chose not to become one of those people. He chose to come on the bottom. And keep in mind also that when God came here, he not only chose not to become one of them, but he was actively against them. Does them include us? Think about this in your spare time this way. This is found in Luke chapter 1. And you can go and read it in your own Bible if you just read it. And just read it several times. You could read it every day. And mull it over in your own mind. This is how Jesus chose to come to the earth. 